This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. For the first time in astronomical history, a huge bizarre rock out beyond Neptune has been linked to other orbiting bodies out there. Somehow, the big rock, called 2003 EL61, is almost the size of Pluto and got into orbit out in the Kuiper Belt where most every other object is made of ice. Not only is this huge rocky object out there, it is the only object in our solar system shaped like an American football and tumbling long end over end every four hours. Where did the bizarre, nearly planet-sized rock in the Kuiper Belt come from? And what caused it to be the fastest spinning object orbiting our sun? Planetary astronomer Michael Brown, Ph.D. at Caltech, says he has discovered the answer. In the March 15, 2007 Nature Journal, Dr. Brown describes finding icy satellites that have surface properties nearly identical to those of 2003 EL61. This is the first family of Kuiper Belt objects ever discovered and imply all came from one gigantic impact long ago. The big spinning rock has never been given a real name. It's only referred to as 2003, the year it was discovered, and EL61, which is from an astronomical code list. Why hasn't 2003 EL61 been given a proper name yet? I talked about all this with Professor Brown, well known for his surveys of distant objects in the Kuiper Belt beyond Neptune and Pluto. Dr. Brown was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2006. In fact, it is one of Dr. Brown's discoveries that demoted Pluto from being the ninth planet to only one of many dwarf planets. The largest dwarf planet is Eris. Second in size is Pluto, and the third largest dwarf planet is 2003 EL61. This was one of the biggest surprises. We have always assumed that everything that we see out there is essentially half ice and half rock. We have actually found a few things that even have almost all ice and no rock at all. And so to find this object, when we first realized that it's almost entirely rock, that was a big surprise to us. And um, the strange part about it, of course, is if you look at the surface, the surface is incredibly bright and shiny and icy, and you don't see anything but ice on the surface. So it must be a very thin frosting of ice with all rock underneath. One of the original ideas that somebody came up with just, you know, initially throwing out thoughts on how this could be is that maybe this actually came from the asteroid belt much closer to the sun and somehow got tossed out. But the funny thing is, is that this is, uh, this one object is bigger than the entire asteroid belt put together. You could stuff the entire asteroid belt inside this one. All of the things, everything we, we learned about this as time went on, it just made it stranger and stranger. So the first thing that we realized is that it gets brighter and darker with a, with a two hour period. Um, and, and we realized early on that that's because it's tumbling end over end uh, with a four-hour period, and we see, we see the small end, and then we see the big end, and then the small end, and the big end uh, over the course of four hours. So this thing is shaped almost like a football, except if you, if you took the football and you let some air out of it, and then you stepped on it. It's, uh, it's shaped more like that. Um, the, the long dimension is about the size of Pluto, so it's, it's a pretty big football. The short dimension is about half that size. And when we first found this, we, again, we thought this was really surprising. We didn't expect to find anything so strangely shaped, so, so rapidly rotating. It's, it's the fastest rotating large object in the solar system. So all of these things were, were pointing to something very strange having gone on in the past. Is there any possibility that there was some big event that affected the water on Mars and its atmosphere, the moon, the whole solar system, and may have been responsible for creating this strange 2003 EL61? There were many large bodies in the asteroid belt, other asteroids that collided with each other, that collided with planets, things even like the body that was the size of Mars that hit the Earth that led to the moon being spun off the Earth. So those sorts of things have been well known in the inner part of the solar system 
for a long time. And we also know that in the outer part of the solar system, we can tell that collisions between Kuiper Belt objects must have been important. They appear to have been grinding down the objects to smaller and smaller sizes, but we just had no direct evidence. We had no smoking gun that this had ever happened until this object. The first idea that we really clung on to about how this thing got to be the shape and the rotation is that perhaps it had been larger in the past and it had been hit very hard by another large object with a sort of glancing blow. And that glancing blow would have led it to spin, and that spin itself would have pulled it out um, into the shape like the football. The same glancing blow could have knocked off a lot of the ice that would have been around, and it hit something that was maybe 60% of its size at a tremendous speed, many hundreds of miles an hour, slamming into it, and that gave it the energy to remove all the ice, to make it spin, to give it that crazy shape. The interesting thing that we, we learned, um, once, once we had the idea that, uh, that this thing had been hit, most people didn't believe the idea because you, you could easily calculate the probability that such a large thing would hit another large thing, and you get something like there's one chance out of 10 million that this would happen, and that's pretty low odds. Um, so most people sort of discarded the hypothesis. But the big new piece of data that we just came up with is that we actually found the other pieces that used to be part of 2003 EL61. We found a family of icy Kuiper Belt objects that are pure ice. We have EL61, which is almost pure rock, and we have these new objects, which are almost pure ice, that are in orbits very closely related to the original 2003 EL61 orbit. So it was definitely the smoking gun that these objects had all really once been part of the same object. So now that we know that this impact happened, we can start to watch where the objects have gone since the impact. Since the impact has occurred, most of the objects have stayed more or less in the same place that it happened. EL61 itself the big rapidly rotating body, has moved slightly. And the reason it's moved slightly is because of many, many long-term, long-range interactions, gravitational interactions with Neptune. It's sort of halfway through its evolution, and when it gets to the end stage, the end stage it actually will encounter Neptune. And once it encounters Neptune, it's on a, a one-way journey into Jupiter. And then Jupiter is sort of the, uh, the goalkeeper of the inner solar system. If Jupiter lets it go by it becomes a comet. If Jupiter doesn't let it go by, it just flings it out, out of the solar system entirely. So EL61 itself will go down this path and has the potential to become a, a, a spectacularly bright comet. And would it continue to have its football shape and be moving end over end as it became a comet flung by Jupiter? It would. It would be, uh, it would be an interesting sight because um, you would get these jets coming off of it that were you know, like a, like a yard sprinkler that's uh, with the jets coming and imagine the yard sprinkler moving incredibly quickly. You would get these, these uh, really variable jets going in different directions. I sort of vaguely calculated that it would be as bright as the full moon for decades uh, at a time. It would, be, it would be a pretty spectacular sight if you're willing to wait a billion years for when it happens. So you think it's one billion years it might turn into this uh, over-end, over-end comet? That's right. And why is it that it would take a billion years? Well, it's, it's very slowly evolving, and it's already been doing it for 4.5 billion years. It has a little bit more to go before it ever gets to encounter Neptune. It's because it only gets a tiny little tug from Neptune every time it goes around the sun, and it just you have to add up those tiny tugs before you have enough of an effect to get close enough to really change your orbit dramatically. And if you add the icy pieces that you have found, plus the big rocky football, and you put them together, that would be larger than Pluto? No, it's about two-thirds the size of Pluto. It's, uh, it's not quite larger than Pluto. And when is it going to get a name? <laughs> that is an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. We submitted a name six months ago now to the International Astronomical Union, and uh, the International Astronomical Union has not said a word. So we don't know. And you can't even talk about the name you've submitted? I can at least tell you that it's the name itself that we submitted is from Hawaiian mythology. It's a name for both the main object, the two moons that go around it, and for the entire family all go together. It's a, it's a nice combination. We hope they accept it, but uh, they have been a little bit slow. But why would they not just name this large object? It is because it's a sorted story. It's because this is the object that most people don't remember, luckily, but uh, 
two and a half years ago when we first announced the existence of the large object of Eris, the one bigger than Pluto, the day before another group had announced the existence of this other object, and in fact it was 2003 EL61. We thought that they had legitimately discovered it, so we supported their discovery and we supported them as the discoverers, even though we had actually discovered it ourselves earlier. We hadn't announced the discovery. And the way science works, I think rightly so, is that whoever announces the discovery first is the one who actually officially gets to be the discoverer. But we learned later that they hadn't actually discovered it. They had only discovered our website that told where it was. Their claims had been essentially fraudulent, as far as we can tell. However, the International Astronomical Union hasn't decided who to side with yet at this point. Um, So the announcement of the name will essentially tell you who they believe. And do you expect that to happen any time this year? I have zero idea. Beyond Pluto now, what is the largest object in the solar system out there or beyond Neptune? That's still um, Eris. Eris, the one that, that we uh, discovered um, a little more than two years ago. It's the one that caused poor Pluto to get demoted. And it is how much bigger than Pluto? It's not much bigger. It's actually only about 5% bigger than Pluto. Um, it's about 25% more massive than Pluto. It's, it's clearly heavier, um, although just barely bigger. And is it all ice or ice and rock? No, it, it's like Pluto. It's about half, half ice and half rock. Is Aries defined as a planet or as a Kuiper Belt object? Uh, definitely Kuiper Belt object. I mean, the current definition puts it as puts both Pluto and Eris as dwarf planets, and, and I think that's a very good place for them. Dwarf planets who are members of the Kuiper Belt. And what is the main distinction now between a dwarf planet and one of the main planets? It's purely size. It's a combination of size and whether you reside in one of these belts. Things in the asteroid belt, things in the Kuiper Belt are not legitimate planets. Large objects that are outside these belts are planets. What are you working on now that excites you the most? We are continuing. We're looking for more of these very distant, very large objects. And uh, the hope is that we've really just hit the tip of the iceberg and we'll continue to find more. And you think that there would be other objects out in the Kuiper Belt and beyond that would be as large or larger than Pluto? Not in the Kuiper Belt, but definitely beyond the Kuiper Belt. So that's where we're looking now. And you want to try to find them because? For two big reasons. One is that uh, by finding these things that are left over from the creation of the solar system, we are learning about um, what was there back when the solar system formed and where it was. And two is that these are the big ones are the ones that we can study in the most detail. So we're learning more about the processes that are involved in making a large, icy, planet-sized thing and what happens geologically. I thought I would fill in some of the gaps that Professor Brown politely left out about the dispute over 2003 EL61's discovery. Four years ago, Dr. Brown and his team had been observing the strange object for six months, trying to better understand EL61's odd shape and rotation before announcing their find. Then suddenly astronomers at the Sierra Nevada Observatory in Spain, led by José Luis Ortiz Moreno, claimed EL-61 was their discovery. However, further investigation showed that a website containing archives of where the Brown team telescopes had been pointed while tracking 2003 EL-61 had been accessed eight times in the three days preceding Ortiz Moreno's announcement. Further, computers with IP addresses were traced back to the website of the Institute of Astrophysics in Andalusia, Spain, where Ortiz Moreno works. That was a week after Professor Brown had published an abstract for an upcoming conference at which he had planned to announce the discovery of 2003 EL61. Dr. Brown's abstract referred to 2003 EL61 by a code, which was the same code used in the online telescope logs. It was learned that the Andalusia computers had accessed those telescope logs containing that code directly instead of through Dr. Brown's research homepage. When Ortiz Moreno was asked about his online activity, Ortiz emailed back to Dr. Brown that the professor was hiding objects and that, quote, the only reason why we are now exchanging email is because you did not report your object, unquote. As Dr. Brown has pointed out, 
Such an accusation contradicts the accepted scientific practice of analyzing one's research until there is some confidence that data is accurate and then submitting it for peer review prior to any public announcement. Although the matter has not yet been settled, Professor Brown has petitioned the International Astronomical Union to credit his team rather than Ortiz Moreno as the discoverers of 2003 EL61. At least one authority within the IAU has indicated Brown's team will end up being recognized as the discoverers. As if our solar system could not be more strange, Saturn continues to amaze everyone. It was only a few months ago that the Cassini spacecraft photographed the ring planet South Pole, which looks like a huge eye staring out into space, thought to be shaped by waves of south polar winds. In the past six months, for the first time since Voyager's flybys of Saturn in the early 1980s, Saturn's North Pole has been clearly seen in both visual and infrared spectrometry. There, in all its baffling glory, is a six-sided hexagon nearly 15,000 miles across and 60 miles deep, apparently created by north polar winds that have been blowing in the hexagonal shape for at least two decades. Saturn's north pole hexagon is so big that nearly four planet Earths could fit inside. Kevin Baines, Ph.D. and atmospheric physicist with Cassini's visual and infrared mapping spectrometer team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, told reporters, quote, This is a very strange feature lying in a precise geometric fashion with six nearly equal straight sides. We've never seen anything like this on any other planet. Indeed, Saturn's thick atmosphere, where circle-shaped waves dominate, is perhaps the last place that you would expect to see such a six-sided geometric figure. And yet, there it is, unquote. You can see images of the Saturn North and South Poles and Dr. Brown's 2003 EL61 research in my Earth Files report at www.earthfiles.com. As Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman once said, quote, Not only is the universe stranger than you can imagine, it is stranger than you can imagine. Unquote. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. 